Turn your Bibles, if you will, please, to Matthew, the book of Matthew. Chapter 1. We'll be starting in uh, verse 18. Let's uh, stand for the reading of God's Word if you can. If you can't, we understand. But God's Word needs to be reverenced. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. How many are you glad that Jesus saves from sin? Amen. amen and amen. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So I'm continuing my, mes- my series on why I believe in God, and specifically the God of the Bible, I'm going to be starting uh, a topic of that called uh, the Messiah Mosaic. I'll be getting about halfway through it today, and then, uh, Lord willing, finishing it next week. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning. Just ask for your blessing today. Please be with me. Help me to say the words you would have me say. Please minister to the seekers who are here today. Please minister to those who... Uh, might be wondering, please minister to all of us, increase our faith in you and your word. Give us a certain faith, Lord, a faith of certainty that we can boldly proclaim you to those around us, having experienced you personally ourselves. Just ask for this in Jesus' name. Please forgive me my many, many sins. Cleanse my heart and make me fitting for your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> so, I, I talked last week about a proposition. A proposition that's very compelling to me. Uh, that there are four data points, if you would, about Jesus Christ that are independent of each other. Uh, they are not dependent on each other. They are, they are completely independent. And these four data points all point to the same conclusion. uh, That Jesus Christ is who he says he is, the Son of God. The first data point I talked about last week, that Jesus Christ lived and died as the Gospels described, miracles and teaching included. Today I'll be teaching on uh, that someone very much like Jesus Christ had been promised in the Jewish Scriptures. Uh, in some situations, for over a thousand years, some some closer to his birth, but but uh, uh, someone who looked very much like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ physically died on a Roman cross. This is the third data point, and three days later was seen alive by credible eyewitness who, eyewitnesses who touched him, who talked to him, who watched him eat solid food, who examined his wounds, and had seen that the the uh, the tomb itself was empty. And the fourth point is that the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was an actual event. And for 2,000 years, those who, have, who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus alone as their personal Savior experience the salvation of not just forgiveness of sins, but a transformed life, exactly like Jesus said the Holy Spirit was going to do when he came. Now, the proposition is this. If these four data points about Jesus Christ can be shown to be true, then Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God. And I'm endeavoring to show that these four data points can be shown objectively that they are true. Last week I talked about the first one, 
that Jesus Christ lived as the Gospels described, miracles included. I showed it uh, uh, through history, historical uh, uh, methods, that everybody at that point in that part of the world, at that point of time, believed Jesus Christ was a miracle worker. I, I showed through writings of people from, uh, well, first of all, I showed that, uh, that the eyewitnesses who were the friends of Jesus his, in his churches believed he did miracles. Um, they accepted the Gospels as we have them today. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today. I said, the fact of the matter is, the Gospels were taken to them while the churches were still full of eyewitnesses. And they accepted them as accurate biographies. And that's pretty important because what that means is that literally the only people in the history of man who knew the truth about Jesus Christ accepted them, the Gospels, as what actually happened. They didn't say, no, that's, that didn't happen. Um, I've used this illustration before, but what if I were to say that, uh, that Pastor Dan Leidig, the founder of Longview Bible Baptist Church, I come up here and say, you know, Pastor Dan Leidig, he wasn't just a pastor, he was a, he was a prophet. He was doing miracles. He was healing people here in the church. Well, first of all, you wouldn't just accept it and say, yeah, I've never heard this before. This is weird stuff, man. Yeah. Secondly, you say, is there anybody around, here who, around who was alive at that time? Or who was in this church at that time? And Bill Meeks is one. My wife is another. You ask them, is what your husband says is true? She say, absolutely not. Don't believe a word he says. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it happened at the church. I mean, when the Gospels came, it wasn't new stuff. The eyewitnesses said, yeah, that's exactly the Jesus we remembered. So the friends of Jesus accepted the, uh, the miracles as that's what happened. The eyewitnesses who were neutral accepted the miracles. Josephus, the, the, the neutral historian, he didn't really have an axe to grind with Jesus Christ. He said, yeah, he was a miracle worker. He did wondrous works. He used the same word uh, describing Jesus' works as he used to describe the miracles of Elijah when he wrote about Elijah. And finally, the eyewitnesses who hated Jesus believed he did miracles. Uh, uh, the enemies of Jesus who wrote about this, they, they admitted the miracles happened, they just tried to explain them away as being works of Satan. Now, the most difficult thing to believe in the Gospels are the miracles. How many would agree with that? That's the most difficult part. If it can be shown that those are historical, then the other aspects of his life as recorded in the Gospels can be accepted as historical. And from a purely historical perspective, we can say that Jesus Christ lived and died very much as the, the Gospels describe. We'll say, yeah, I believe that because the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah, right, okay, granted, I do too. <laughs> but let's suppose, let's just set that aside for a second, and just from a historical standpoint, yeah, he was a miracle worker. Uh, that's what everybody said. Uh, U.S. News and World Report was, uh, was writing about the Jesus Seminar back, back a couple decades. And they recorded this in interesting point that the Jesus Seminar made about Jesus Christ. And the Jesus Seminar was not a fundamentalist Christian organization. They're very loosely Christian. They're very skeptical Christians. Uh, they try to erase much of, of the New Testament. Their admission was this. Everybody back there believe Jesus did miracles. And we're not talking about Stone Age cave dwellers. These are sophisticated folk. We have to admit that the miracles happened. Not that, yeah, people believe they happened, but they happened. Whatever else they want to deny about Jesus, they had to admit that the miracles actually happened. So, from a purely historical perspective, we can say Jesus lived and died very much like the Gospels described. And I want to, for the purpose of this message and, and next week's, I want to give an overview of Jesus' life. Could you put that overview up there, Stu? <clears throat> so here's the overview. These are the high points of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' life. He was born human, yet somehow 
was believed to be God. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He came with a message from God. He was a miracle worker. He started his ministry around 30 AD. He died as a sacrifice for sins. He was believed to have been risen from the dead. And the news of him went viral around the world. So I'm going to hit these four points. These, I think, succinctly line up or, or, or uh, sum up the life of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show that these points were definitively predicted in the Old Testament prophecies. The, the Old Testament wrote prophecies about a coming Savior. And put, the, put up that, uh, that mosaic. This is a mosaic that was found on the, a picture of a mosaic that was found on a floor in Pompeii. Pompeii was destroyed about 90 AD by the uh, eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And when they still are excavating that city, they found a beautiful house, and the floor was, was a, this mosaic. And it's, it's the battle of, uh, of Issus between Alexander the Great and whatever the Persian general, uh, uh, somebody said a name? Could have been. Could have been. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. Alexander the Great doesn't have a helmet on. That sounds so much like Hollywood today. You have the, hero, the hero can't wear a helmet. I'm sure in the, in the battle he actually wore a helmet. <laughs> but uh, a mosaic is, in this situation, it's literally thousands of colored ceramic pieces. And they're put together in a way that they make a picture. Each individual piece is kind of meaningless. But when you look at them all together, there's a very clear picture. In the Old Testament, there, they have, there's hundreds of prophecies about a Messiah who is going to come. In this situation, each one is not just meaningless all on its own. There's an actual interesting information in every case. But when you put them together, they form a picture of a life. A very definitive picture of a life. A picture of a life that fits only one life in the history of mankind, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, I've taught this message before in kind of a, like the 30,000 foot view. I'm going to go into more detail and, and spend more time on, on, these, on the prophecies about these high points. And uh, we're just going to kind of look into it so we can see. I mean, this is an adult Sunday school class. I assume you came here because you want to learn. So, Lord willing, we're going to learn something here. So, let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Oh, by the way, the Old Testament uh, was copied historically from the Hebrew to the Greek 150 years before Jesus Christ was born. Now, that's history. It's called the Septuagint. And... Uh, it's the Old Testament as we know it today. It's not like there was a, a bunch of new books written since. So definitively, the Old Testament was, 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 uh, was written before Jesus Christ uh, was born. In Isaiah chapter 11, this is a prophecy about the coming Savior. This one here is a prophecy about His return in power. Um, one thing about the Old Testament prophecies is... is they show two pictures of Jesus Christ. And the, uh, the, the, the Jewish rabbis wondered about this because on one hand they would see Jesus or they would see the Messiah as a king who would come conquering and bring righteousness throughout the world. On the other time they would see that he didn't come in the clouds but that he was actually born and he lived a suffering life and he died. And they wondered about that. How, how can both pictures be true? Jesus explained it that they're both true, it's just two different time frames. He's going to come the first time, or he came the first time as a suffering servant. The second time he's coming as a conquering king and the judge. So this is, a, this is one of the prophecies about Messiah as a conquering king. Now, when you read a similar chapter um, in Zechariah chapter 12, it indicates that this Messiah is going to come from the skies and land on... Uh, uh, the Mount of Olives. So, 
But this is, this is the, same, the same story, the same, the same Messiah. So let's look at uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, that's referring to, uh, he'll be out of the line of David. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity uh, for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Talks about the reign of King Messiah. He's going to come. He's going to fix the problems of the earth. For some people, that's going to be a very wonderful thing. People who love righteousness, people who want the problems to be fixed. For others, that's going to be a very bad thing because they, they, like the, they like the problems. They make lots of money off the problems. And this Messiah is going to judge them. So, but he's going to come. He's going to be the king. He's going to reign out of Jerusalem. So, that's this Messiah. He's going to be of the seed of David. He's going to be a, a, a descendant of David. That's this Messiah. Let's go back uh, three chapters. Chapter 9. In the same context, we start at verse 6. For unto us, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. We've got a human being born of a woman who's going to be called the Mighty God? Well, that's not normal. I mean, legitimately called the mighty God. Not like some people just take the name, well, I'm God. No, this legitimately called the mighty God. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's keep reading. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. We're talking the same person. This is King Messiah. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is King Messiah. Only he's not just a human being. He is the mighty God. How many mighty gods are there? There's only one. This is God. God born as a human. But it's the same promise that we read in, uh, in chapter 11. The same Messiah. Of the seed of David. Let's go back to uh, chapter 7. Same context. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Now of all the uh, Messianic prophecies, this is one of the ones that you get the most pushback on. And if you have questions on that, I'll be glad to answer them. But that does not fit today's purview for, for this message. But just understand that this, this, stands, this stands firm. A virgin is going to conceive. So let's get that list up there. Did you get the one with the check marks? Were you able to do that? Okay. Just like that. Thank you. So, 
Was there someone of the line of David, born as a human, yet historically was called God, who was believed to be, by the eyewitnesses and the people who knew, including his mother, believed to be born of a virgin? Was there such a, is there such a story in, in the world today, historically? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's in the Gospels. So that's the first, the first thing. Let's go on a little bit further. Let's go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Right after Jonah, Amos, Jonah, Micah. Micah 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Okay? But a specific ruler in Israel. One who has a very distinguished characteristic. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Same Messiah, who's going to be ruler in Israel and ruler of the world. But he wasn't just, he didn't start when he was born. He had existed eternity past. That's God. There's only one being who exists in eternity past. That's God. It's the same, the same person described uh, in, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 9. Let's get that list back up there. So, was there someone who was born human, according to the historical record, born human yet called God, who was born of a virgin, who was born in Bethlehem? Well, yeah, there was. Same story. Yet, these passages were written literally hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born. Let's go on. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy. This is Moses. Chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 18. This was written about 1,500 years, a little bit less than that, before Jesus Christ was born. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. Now start at verse 17. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So, this was a promise about a coming prophet. One who had three specific descriptions. One, he would be a prophet like unto Moses. He would have a specific message from God. And he would be a prophet. Okay? So let's take a look at these real quick. First, before we do that, let's go to John chapter 1, verse 21. John 1, 21. And we see that the, uh, the Jewish people expected this, this, this promise to be fulfilled. In John chapter 1, verse 21, uh, they came to uh, uh, John the Baptist, and, and they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he said, No. They're referring to this passage. Are you that prophet that God said was going to come? Let's go to John chapter 6. In verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. They expected this, this passage to be fulfilled. They were looking for a prophet who was one thing, first of all, a prophet. Secondly, he was like Moses. And three, he would come with a specific message from God. So, first of all, he would be a prophet. Uh, let's take a look real quick to Matthew chapter 11. 
Matthew chapter 11. Verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. So in other words, there were three primary cities that Jesus were kind of Jesus' uh, uh, area that he did most of his, his, his works in, uh, in Galilee. There was a, the first one was a, a Capernaum. That was, that was where he, he stayed with, uh, with Peter and his family. And uh, the second one was, uh, was uh, Bethsaida and Chorazin, those three, those three cities. And they accepted Jesus as a prophet. But they did not accept him as a son of God. And they refused to repent. And Jesus pronounced judgment on them. Verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. I'm not going to do it now, but if you have a cell phone, Google these cities and see what they look like today. God, Jesus said it's, they're going to be judged and the judgment's going to be permanent. It's not going away. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't going to go away. Just like uh, the original city of Tyre. That, that, that city never returned. So Google these cities and see what they look like today. Google the pictures of them. There's another city that was in that, in that group. It was, it was the city of Tiberias. Google that city. Jesus didn't pronounce judgment on it, and it's a very prosperous city to this day. What Jesus pronounced actually came true in real life. This is not theoretically pie-in-the-sky, um, you know, Pinocchio-type stuff. This, this is real. And Jesus is someone whose judgment we need to fear because he has demonstrated he does actually judge the unrepentant. That is a fact that happens in real life to real people. Um, I'm running out of time already, so, so he's a prophet. Secondly, he would be a prophet like Moses. Now here's something pretty interesting. There are an awful lot of correlations between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus Christ. Um, you look at the high points of the life of Moses, and you find it correlated to the, the high points of Jesus. For example, both Moses and Jesus had a question about who their parents were. The Egyptians did not know who Moses' parents were. And uh, uh, outside of his disciples, nobody knew who Jesus' dad was. With both, when they were born, there was a ruler massacring babies and trying to find them. Uh, Moses uh, was put in, 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 a, in, a, in a basket in the Nile River to hide, from the, uh, to hide him from the, uh, the soldiers who were trying to kill all the male babies. And Jesus was uh, being hunted for by, uh, by Herod when he was born. And, uh, and so there's that correlation. Both of them were saved by Egypt. Yeah, although Moses was, uh, was hunted by Pharaoh, it was Pharaoh's daughter who saved him. And Joseph took, uh, took Jesus and Mary to Egypt to get, get away from Herod. Both rejected by Israel. Uh, Moses tried to, to uh, in his own power, to, uh, to save Israel, and, uh, and the Jews rejected him. Jesus, in his first advent, uh, was unsuccessful in, in, in bringing salvation to Israel. And there are Jews who get saved, but uh, he was rejected by the nation. Both left Israel and found a Gentile wife. Moses went out and um, married a, G a Gentile lady named Zipporah. Jesus went out and got a Gentile bride. That's us. Moses saved Israel in his second advent, and Jesus will save Israel when he returns the second time. 
after Moses was gone for 40 years, he came back and, um, and he got the Jews out of, the, out, of, uh, out of Egypt. Both in their day were the greatest miracle workers of all time. Until Jesus, Moses was the greatest miracle worker. Jesus surpassed him. But both in their time were the greatest miracle workers. Moses turned water into blood. Jesus turned water into wine. Moses fed the multitude in the wilderness. Jesus fed the 5,000 in the wilderness. Both fasted 40 days in the wilderness. Moses brought the law and the sacrificial system. Jesus fulfilled the law and the, sa the sacrifices. The generation that rejected Moses were judged within 40 years. The generation that rejected Jesus was judged at 40 years. The destruction of Jerusalem. Moses smote the rock to give life-giving water to the Israel. Jesus was the rock smitten to give the living water to the world. There's correlation. After, I, I, didn't, I didn't show you all. <laughs> there's, there, there's, there's actually quite, quite a lot on there. So there was a correlation between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. This prophet was to come with a specific message from God. A specific message from God. And here's where I want to end this, uh, end this lesson. Did the prophets describe this message that Messiah was going to bring? What was this specific message? The Bible says it was a specific message, which when you hear it, you need to respond to it. And if you don't respond to it, God's going to ask you why. He's going to judge you for not responding to it. It's a specific message. What is that message? Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are blind, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in the book of Luke, Jesus is going to announce his ministry right after his baptism. He's going to announce his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. And he quotes this passage. And he ends right here at this phrase, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The next phrase is, and the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't, he didn't say that. He stopped it just before that. And that's an indication of the two advents of Jesus Christ. The first advent is this specific message he's going to give. The second advent is if is he's going to judge those who don't accept that message. When Jesus proclaimed his ministry to Nazareth, he stopped at that point uh, to proclaim the acceptable, let's see, um, the acceptable year of the Lord. There's a time frame that we're all living in. It's the time frame of grace. We're in that, in that time frame. That's the acceptable year of the Lord. We need to accept the Lord during that time frame because we won't always be in this time frame. There will come a time of judgment if we reject this grace. Let's look at uh, Isaiah 42. We'll see it a little more clearly. I'm going to kind of go into some of the details. Isaiah 42, <clears throat> starting at verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I, have, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. In other words, he's not, he, he's not violently trying to over, overthrow the, uh, uh, the, the establishment there, not with violence. Verse 3, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. What in the world is that? Okay, you got a plant that's growing but it's damaged. Uh, something happened to it. Part of the side of that plant's caved in. It's trying to grow straight. It's having a hard time. It's kind of growing crookedly because it's damaged. And as soon as the first serious wind comes, that plant's going down and it's not coming back. It's a damaged plant. The Messiah 
doesn't just rip that plant up. The Messiah fixes the plant. A smoking flax shall he not quench. Have you ever tried to start a fire with, a, with, with damp tinder, like a, maybe paper that wasn't quite dry? It's, it's, it's frustrating. It smokes. There's some coals there, but you can't hardly get the thing, get a flame out of it. What do we do? Well, we put the fire out and we get some dry stuff put in there and start over again. Jesus doesn't do that. He's going to work with what he's got. He's going to make fire come out of that thing. You got that smoking piece of flax there. It's damp. It's, things aren't working well. It, it wants to get a fire going. It wants to burn for God. It wants to, to, to be a light for the world, but it's messed up, man. Nothing's working right. Too many years in sin. Too many years doing things that are wrong. Too many bad habits. I can't quite get it together. The Messiah, when he comes, he's going to work with that and fix it. It may take a lifetime to do so. He don't stop. What is that? Buddy, that's the special message. That's grace. That's grace. A whole new message that had not been preached there. At that time frame, if you messed up, sorry, dude, it's all over for you. You can't get it right. Jesus said, I got a different message. Here's a message from God. You lived a life of sin. Your life's polluted by sin. You're pathetic. But I love you. I died on the cross for your sins. I rose from the dead. I'll wash those sins away. You can't have a relationship with God, a holy God, as you are. You blew it. You've sinned. The first time we sinned, we blew it. The first time we sinned, we, we were pathetic. We can't make it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we, we're, we're, we're stuck. But the Messiah was going to come and work with us stuck folk. Instead of just ripping us out and starting all over. Smoking flax, can't seem to get the fire going. I'll get that fire going. It may take a few years, but that fire is going to burn bright. It may take 10 years, but that fire is going to be glorifying to God. I ain't going to stop. In Philippians, Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to say, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He don't stop. That was the ministry. Those were the words the Messiah was going to teach. It doesn't matter what sins you're addicted to. Jesus Christ isn't going to give up on you. He'll keep working with you. He'll keep working with you. He'll keep working with you. Till those sins are out of you. And eventually he's going to raise you perfect, both in your record, your guilt is gone, and in your practice before God. That's the specific message. The Messiah is going to come with a new message, a specific message. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to be a prophet like Moses. He's going to come with a new message, a message of hope, a message of binding up the brokenhearted, a message of raising those of us who are spiritually dead, a message of bringing a salvation that ultimately brings us to perfection before God. That was the promise that the Messiah was going to do. Let's get that back up there. Let's take a look at our list. Has there been, in the history of man, someone who was seriously believed to be born human, yet be God, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, came with a specific message from God, It's the same story. Same story. But for those who are here, if anyone here is, is, is seeking, today's your day of grace. God's not angry with you. God is looking at you with love. He says, yeah, you blew it. Yeah, you're pathetic. 
But I like pathetic folk. I can do an awful lot with pathetic folk. I can raise pathetic folk to glory. Just come to me. Believe in me. Trust in me, Jesus says. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Ask for your blessing in this. If there's someone here who's seeking, please bring them to you today. And help all of us to recognize entirely objectively, you are the truth. There is no one else like you. You are the Son of God. You are the Savior of the world. And help us to live that way. And to put you above everything else, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.